Welcome everyone, we'll be getting in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. We will begin in just a moment. Good evening, we will be in in just a moment. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Mursky Mickey. I'm the Deputy Director of the Baltimore Jewish Council, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us tonight for our advocacy evening. We want to first acknowledge the devastation in Turkey and surrounding areas from the recent earthquake, and we want to thank Jewish federations across the country for raising much needed funds for the victims and their families and the rescue efforts. We're also thankful to the Israeli government for being one of the first, as always, to respond by sending medical relief. Tonight, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please be sure to use the Q&A function on Zoom and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Now, I wanna turn in the program over to Ron Halber, Executive Director of the JCRC of Greater Washington, Howard Libid, Executive Director of the Baltimore Jewish Council, and Shauna Levy, Director of Community Engagement for the Jewish Federation of Howard County. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to the virtual keynote event for Maryland Jewish Advocacy Day 2023. On behalf of the Baltimore Jewish Council, the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, the JCRC of Greater Washington, the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, the Jewish Federation of Howard County, and the JCRC of Howard County, we want to welcome everyone who is here, welcome everyone who is here tonight. Even as our legislators in Annapolis return to a more of an air of a of an in-person format, we gather tonight in a virtual format for the third year in a row as construction around the State House limits the availability of in-person spaces for laws receptions like our trad traditional Jewish Advocacy Day gathering. We are grateful to all of those of you who have joined us, representatives of Governor Moore's administration, members of the General Assembly elected officials from our local jurisdictions, and most importantly, the community members who are here to engage in advocacy. We also wanna thank the lay leaders and professional staffs from our three communities, representing our federations and our many agencies that do so much critical work every day. A special thanks to the chairs of our three federations, Yehuda Neuberger of the Associated, Sam Kaplan of the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, and Rabbi Gordon Fuller of the Jewish Federation of Howard County. For all of the elected officials who are here with us tonight on Zoom, your presence is a clear demonstration of the support you've shown for our communities and the work we do on behalf of those in need of Maryland. The agencies of our Jewish federations provide a vast array of services throughout the state. We feed and house the poor, care for the elderly, and provide medical, disability, and behavioral health services to people of all races, ethnicities, and religions. We also help to ensure the security for our communities something that has become more important than ever. We are guided by our obligation of tikkun olam to repair the world. I would like to thank the Moore administration and members of the General Assembly for supporting so many of our initiatives, including our aging in place programs, which provide services that allow seniors to age comfortably in their own homes, our funding for the care of aging Holocaust survivors, initiatives for the security of schools, daycare centers and houses of worship, and the Maryland Israel Development Center, which supports business partnerships and trade between Maryland and Israel. 
I also want to thank lawmakers for support of capital budget projects for our communities that will make a real difference as we do our work, which this year includes the Pearlstone Center, the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington's Community Impact Center of Montgomery County, and the Associated Park Heights Campus. All of our communities are also committed to helping see through a wide range of legislative issues important to our communities. With the surge of hate and anti-Semitism, as well as the disturbing national surveys on the lack of knowledge about the Holocaust among high school graduates and adults, we're working with legislators on a wide range of pieces of legislation to more effectively combat hate and extremism. We're also looking at ways to assist our public schools and more effectively teaching students about the horror of the Holocaust and the roots of anti-Semitism. We welcome the commitment of our state leadership to helping our synagogues, schools, and other nonprofit institutions afford the security measures that are unfortunately so necessary. We are advocating for expanded access to healthcare, for protections for seniors, and for so much more. Next year, let's hope that we can resume making the trip to Annapolis to engage in face-to-face -face conversations. Now let me turn the program back over to Howard to introduce our first keynote speaker. Tonight's first speaker is a longtime friend of our Jewish communities, and she can only be described as a passionate advocate for Baltimore and all of Maryland. In November, Brooke Lehrman became the first woman to be independently elected to a statewide office in Maryland, winning election as Comptroller. Based on her, her long record of hard work, accomplishments, and advocacy, her victory was hardly a surprise. She served two effective terms in the House of Delegates representing Baltimore City, while also working as a civil rights attorney. A graduate of Walt Whitman High School in Montgomery County, and yes, she has roots in the DC suburbs too. Comptroller Rearman has a long record of advocacy at the neighborhood, city, and state level. On a personal note, I wanna thank the Comptroller and her team for giving me the opportunity to serve on her transition team earlier this winter. We're honored that Comptroller Learman is joining us tonight to share her vision for Maryland and her agenda as she starts her first term. If you have questions for the Comptroller, and, and not just if you have questions about your tax return, please be sure to use the Q&A function while she's speaking, with, and we'll try and get some questions answered at the end of her talk. With that, let me turn the Zoom over to Comptroller Learman. Thank you so much, Howard, um, and hello, Ron. It's wonderful to see you, Abby, Sarah, Shauna. It's wonderful to be here with you tonight, even if it is virtual. Um, and next year, feel free or any time to call us in the Comptroller's office and use our big room. Um, we'd love to host you in the Treasury Building sometime. Um, so I'm really delighted to be with you all. Um, and thank you, Howard, for serving on the team. Or, um, I'm looking forward to reading the uh, final report when it comes out this month. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, like Howard said, I'm Brooke Learman. Um, I'm honored to be the 34th Comptroller of the state of Maryland. And um, it has been a whirlwind uh, about three and a half weeks, um, maybe almost four weeks. Uh, it has been exciting as I've assumed uh, this new leadership post after two terms in the House of Delegates where I had the honor of representing District 46. <coughs> Um, which of course includes um, the Jewish Museum of Maryland, B'nai Israel, and many other important sites um, in Jewish culture and history in the state of Maryland, um, and really nationally too, in terms of the Lloyd Street Synagogue. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, and yes, I did cover my bases. I did grow up in Montgomery County uh, before moving to Baltimore. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I have brothers in Prince George's and you know people all over. So um, it's really wonderful to be here with you all tonight. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Comptroller's Office and that I'd be delighted to take questions and I will put an email in the chat where you can direct your tax refund questions to as well. Um, you know, the Comptroller's office is really, it's the office that sees every dollar in and every dollar out in the state of Maryland. Um, I have learned through meeting with other treasurers and comptrollers and state financial officers around the country that really there's no other office quite like it in America. Um, in most other states, they divide up many of the duties that we have in one office in Maryland. Um, and so I'm honored to have this big role, both as the tax collector, and we are in tax season, um, and 
and but also you know as a member of the board of public works which is a unique institution in american state government where the board of the governor the comptroller and the treasurer oversee all of our grants that are uh, and and contracts that are two hundred thousand dollars or more um all exoneree payments wetlands licenses you name it the board of public works has to approve those expenditures um, and so I take that duty really seriously and I'm dedicated to making sure that we're keeping our that we're doing business in a way that brings best value and not just lowest cost and that we're really re-engaging and reinforcing and working with our um, to meet our minority business enterprise goals as well. Um, we were the first state in the nation to have an MBE program and yet we've fallen far behind in coming anywhere close to the goals that we've set. Um, I'm also excited to make sure as the vice chair of the state retirement and pension board that we're doing our duty to keep um, our pension savings safe for our retirees. Um, and after serving as chair of the joint committee on pensions, um, I'm enthusiastic about bringing my perspective to that board and making sure that we do right by all of, all of our retirees and also thinking through the impact that our investments have um, on, on Marylanders. Um, so there's so much to do. In the comptroller's office, I will say there are um, a number of things that right off the bat we need to be focusing on. Um, and we've identified, identified some of those real modernization projects and our public engagement work um, to make sure that we're getting out, we're reimagining, number one, reimagining how we engage with the public and how we engage with local governments to make sure we're being proactive and present um, to bring the resources of the office to the people of Maryland and to our municipal and local and county governments as well, to make sure that they're getting the support they need, whether that's on revenue estimates or uh, refunds. Um, we're looking forward to reimagining how to do that work. Um, number two, we're really trying to make sure that we can build an agency that the people of Maryland deserve. Um, I'm excited about the new team that I've brought in and leadership and uh, into the comptroller's office. We've already reorganized the leadership structure of the comptroller's office to create more accountability um, and more clear lines. And I'm excited because we have a real mandate to work to strengthen the office um, and to make sure that we're focusing on great customer service. And another piece of that is number three, modernizing the office. So um, whether it's updating our website, it needs an update, um, or moving away from the DOS-based system that oversees all of our tax returns. Yes, everyone remembers DOS, the green screens. Um, we process 3.3 million tax returns every year. Last year, that's how many we did. Half of them have to be touched by hand right now. Um, it's inefficient. We miss fraudulent activity. It's a problem. We can do better. Um, and so we are working right now to implement a new online system over the coming years as well. And then our accounting system. Maryland has the oldest state accounting system in the nation. Um, it was based on a mainframe and runs using the COBOL programming language. So I'll be working with the treasurer of the state and the secretary of the Department of Budget and Management to make sure that we're updating our accounting system as well. And that in turn will save Marylanders money because we won't need to run everything off of a mainframe. It will mean that we are more nimble in our systems and it will be better for our nonprofits because we'll be able to pay more quickly, track more easily and be more efficient with the work that we need them to do so that we can support them. So I'm really excited about all the things that we have going on at the Comptroller's Office, excited to keep getting out and hearing how we can help you um, and work with you and excited to continue being an advocate. So thank you, Howard and Ron, for all your exceptional leadership, for your friendship. Um, I'm really excited to keep engaging and digging in um, over the years to come. Thanks for having me and happy to take questions. Thanks. Uh, we have about 100 people on now and I've gotten a couple of questions sent to me. I, um, I will just note, boy, that the, the the computer systems you have seem so old that the 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 comptroller's office probably isn't even vulnerable to viruses because those computers are before the time of. Yes, of, although <laughs> I will tell you, one of the first contracts I signed was with a twenty four seven monitoring uh, cybersecurity monitoring firm. So <laughs> I'm not messing around. I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. I mean, as you mentioned, being on the board of public works gives you something of a bully pulpit too, in terms of being able to talk about and, and be a leader on issues that maybe aren't just taxes and, and things like that. Do you have do you have kind of some issues you want to continue to pursue or pursue, you know, help to make sure attention gets on them through the course of your the contracts you're approving and that work through the Board of Public Works? 
Sure, absolutely. So, you know, one I mentioned, which is, of course, our MBEs and really digging in and working to make sure that we're meeting those minority business enterprise goals that are so essential for building a stronger state and making sure that we're building communities that are more equitable, more, more resilient and more prosperous, really, in every community. Um, Two, making sure that we're thinking through how the contracts that we're signing and the procurements that we do affect our environment. Um, you know, really thinking through the ramifications of when we build new public buildings or procure new spaces, that we're thinking through the energy. Uh, you know, are they LEED certified? Are we doing, you know, are we procuring electric buses instead of diesel buses? What are the, you know, all of these things really matter. And the decisions that we're making now and the money that we spend now, it's not just about the next four years, right? This is about the next 40 years to come um, on many of these contracts. So it's just really essential that we are thinking through those issues. Um, and then finally, you know, there are a number of issues that I worked on as a legislator that I will always care about. You know, I worked with Abby and the BJC on many housing issues. I, and I think affordable housing is really one of the issues of our time, um, you know, making sure that people have a place to live. Um, I worked with um, you all on many domestic violence issues, which are issues, you know, dear, near and dear to my heart. Um, and I know you will continue doing that important work. And of course, supporting our small businesses and entrepreneurs, right? They're the heart of our economy. Um, and so, you know, anything that I can do um, to make sure it's easier to start a business in Maryland and grow a business in Maryland is something that I want to keep doing. So I, I'm asked, um, one of the questions I was asked is, is there, are there ways that private industry or even nonprofits like the Associated or, or the Federation of Washington can can help you with modernize, modernize, modernizing the state systems and also to protect from cyber attacks. Are there ways we can, we or private industry can be more, can be helpful as you're thinking about that? Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, many people who I've met through the campaign have already, and some of your leaders, some of the folks you mentioned, um, and others have have stepped up and made connections for me, offered advice, um, you know, sent our job description for a CIO to people. Um, and so, I think really, you know, making sure if, you know, identifying experts in the field, um, in, you know, companies that Matt, that care about these issues that could be interested in, in working with us or providing advice, like I'm always interested in hearing more. Um, certainly, you know, I've actually, we've recently met a company through um, the uh, Maryland Israel Development Corporation um, that we are currently, um, uh, you know, in talks with. Um, they provide an amazing product um, that's been really interesting to learn about. Um, and so, you know, I think there are so many um, great companies out there that I'm always open. I, you know, I have an open door. Really interested in talking to people who care about these issues. So this question's a little tricky, but I'll, I'll, I'll um, do you have productivity goals for state employees, or is that? or contracts or what are like, how do you assess that? I, I guess that probably comes from someone who's skeptical of how hard state, may, maybe how hard state employees work. Although <laughs> it's my, really my, my wife works for the state. She works pretty hard upstairs. Yeah, I, uh, no, it's a good question. You know, look, I'll be honest. We have how we have structured um, our depart, uh, the comptroller's agency, and we're still learning about, you know, di dividing down. But I, what I did have concerns, you know, not about people and whether they're doing what they need to do, but I had concerns about accountability and that were we actually keeping track of and having our finger on the pulse of what was happening at every level in the comptroller's office, which is why we've divided the office into sort of four departments now. It used to be basically one, and one person had like 20 direct reports, and, you know, you can't manage that way um, and know what's going on. And so we have four deputy comptrollers now, each of them with a department. We all talk among each other. Um, we're also creating an office of business operations um, to sort of develop policies and guidelines, um, which don't exist in the office to keep track of things. Um, and as far as in terms of like productivity, you know, it's interesting because every department in the comptroller's office is quite different. And measuring productivity, it's it's something that I'm interested in, but perhaps not in the way that the, the person who's asking the question is asking. You know, for instance, we have had a tough time hiring lawyers in the comptroller's office. The starting salary for a lawyer in the comptroller's office is fifty six thousand um, dollars. Yeah, I can't hire a lawyer because no lawyer will work for that, right? I mean, it's right. so we have real challenges. We need to be able to pay people more so that we can bring in the people that we need. But then, you know, I would rather have one of the lawyers who's doing audits um, rather than doing, you know, 500 
audits of low wage workers who earn the earn, who have the earned income tax credit coming in and you know maybe getting a few bucks here and there but or and no bucks you know, and no money at all for most people i'd rather them do you know 100 audits and have them be on much more complicated matters where the stakes are much higher and where we the the possibility of earning much more money exists where we're actually working to close the tax gap. Um, and so, you know, some of what I'm excited about is bringing in new technologies to help us identify some of those places and then having the lawyers and the people in place to do the audits um, and to do the follow-up that's necessary. Um, so, uh, but yes, you know, we're always making sure that uh, people are there and being responsive and we're, you know, we do our best to make sure that the people who are there are really doing focused on serving customers. That's, you and, know, and you, you have offices all across the state too. It's not all based in Annapolis. Is that right? Right, exactly. So our headquarters is in Annapolis. We have three buildings in Annapolis, the treasury building, um, which is the first, if you're driving towards the state house, first one on the right with Louis Goldstein out in front. Um, right behind that is our revenue administration building. There's a tiny building in the corner that no one sees, which is our data center. Um, we have a big uh, a big presence in Baltimore, about 300 employees. We're moving from State Center to downtown, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, and do, then do we have, have 11. Do you have a location? Which building? Seven you know St. Paul, Seven okay. St. Paul Street, um, the old Wells Fargo mm -hmm. building. Um, and then we also have 11 offices around the state, including one in Wheaton, um, one in Greenbelt, um, Cumberland, Hagerstown, Frederick. Um, so, and we have an, uh, a few, a handful of staff in each of those uh, areas as well. And and part of that is you guys have made an effort to try and be more responsive to people in terms of uh, language barriers and things like that, too. Yes, we've really increased our staff um, who are uh, Spanish speakers. I mean, we've seen a huge number of tax, new number of taxpayers who speak Spanish. And so we need to have, um, but other languages as well. Um, and we are really dedicated and focused on making sure that we can increase those, those number, the number of staff who do those taxpayer services. Um, and this year I have a bill in the General Assembly to create an office of taxpayer advocates. Um, and this would be an office uh, modeled after the federal IRS has an office like this, many other state agencies, um, where it's an office that it's not who you go to say, hey, where my, here's my, where's my refund? It's the office you go to to say, hey, I've been trying to get this. I can't figure it out. Who do I talk to? Where do I go? You know, there seems to be lots of different apartments who are working on this. The more complicated matters to have somebody really be the guide through all of the process to help with that. Um, we're also standing up an office, a legal division that will um, that will write private letter rulings, um, mostly for businesses, although I'm sure some individuals will want them that help apply our tax law to a certain fact situation. So that if you're a taxpayer, you have certainty that you're paying the right amount. Um, and you know that uh, we won't audit you because you can base your decision on what we have told you. So we're hoping to stand that office up um, after July 1st when we get those pins, um, those positions as well. So I, I think I know where this question is going, but I'll, I, you'll, I think you'll figure it out too. What, what's your opinion on um, P3, P3 or I guess public-private partnership contracts for 30 plus years? And I suspect <laughs> that's more of a Montgomery County question it is. than it is it's a, okay. uh, no, a question for Baltimore. Yeah, no, I, um, I in theory, uh, you know, theoretically, I don't have a problem with Public private partnerships. I actually think there's some value to some of them if they're, you know, if they're done correctly. Um, I have a lot of concerns that I've articulated over the years about the 50 year um, uh, P3 uh, that the governor, that Governor Hogan um, uh, pursued and signed off on before he left office. Um, I am concerned about, um, you know, how the actual cost to the taxpayers of Maryland. Um, whether things will actually get done. And if we actually build those roads, like I don't actually believe that it would help alleviate traffic. Um, you know, I drive in Northern Virginia sometimes, the traffic there is really bad. <laughs> um, so, you know, I do, there is, the status quo is not acceptable. Um, we need to do more. Um, and I look forward to working with Secretary Paul Wiedefeld to figure out how we can provide traffic relief and also how we can get people to and from Frederick, right? Um, 270 is such a huge challenge as well. So I look forward to working with the Secretary of Transportation on that. Great. Well, I think we are through the, all the quite many questions I got from both that I came up with, but as well as we got a number from our audience. And I thank everybody who's on. Um, and really, we, we, we thank you for um, joining us tonight. Um, we look forward to your leadership making a difference in our state every day as we move forward. And uh, may you uh, 
may you serve in the state as long as uh, your predecessor, Louis Goldstein, in whatever roles you want. <laughs> God bless y'all real good, as he used to say. <laughs> uh, no, I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful for all the important work that you do in Annapolis, but also in our communities um, and uh, you know throughout the entire state. So I look forward to continuing and deepening the relationship. And thanks so much for having me on. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Um, and and as, as we move ahead, I do wanna acknowledge a couple of elected officials who we see on. Um, I see Delegate Dana Stein and, and, and Councilman Izzy Patoka. Um, and thank you both for, uh, for, for being part of the audience today. Um, let me turn it over to my friend, Ron. Thank you, Howard. Um, our next speaker is another long-term friend of our Jewish communities, Treasurer Derek Davis. After representing Prince George's County in the House of Delegates for 27 years, including as chairman of the powerful House Economic Matters Committee, he was elected and sworn in as the 24th Maryland State Treasurer in December of 2021. And in addition to his responsibilities for managing the Office of State Treasurer, Treasurer Davis serves as the Chief Representative of the state, dealing with financial rating agencies and investment banking firms. And he serves on the powerful Board of Public Works along with the Governor and Controller, the influential panel that decides on virtually all state, major state contracts. We thank Mr. Davis, Treasurer Davis, for joining us here tonight to talk about the work of his office and his broader vision for Maryland. And remember, if you have any questions to the treasurer, please be sure to use the Q&A function while he's speaking. Treasurer Davis. Hey, Ron, how you doing? How, how is you, everybody? Boy, I mean, I, thanks for that warm and kind introduction. I got to have you on staff. That yeah. that was terrific. Yeah. By the way, your video is off. I don't know if, you, if you're in a situation where you can activate your video, but if not, you, we can just do this with your audio. That's fine, too. I thought it was on. It, it, let me see if there's something going on. I, I am so bad at this, but it, it's saying stop video like it's on video. So mm. I have no idea what the problem is. That's fine. It's fine. It looks like it is on Treasurer Davis, um, but you might have something covering your camera. Oh. Um, that's no. Um, no, there's nothing on it. I, I apologize. I'm not sure. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. As somebody who has a face for radio, this is good for me. So yeah. uh, for you, it's, for, for you, 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 we're missing you. But, but uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and talk to us okay. a little bit? What's going on? And, and, and again, I apologize. Uh, well, good evening, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to join you all tonight. I'm certainly excited about the opportunity. Uh, I've worked with some of you um, for a number of years, and, and I'm excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, as was stated earlier, I am State Treasurer Derek Davis. And in our time together this evening, I'd like to do two things, introduce myself and provide some background on the state treasurer's office and to share my priorities as treasurer. And I'm gonna try to do it without boring you all to death. So if I start slipping into that, just yank me back in, tell, tell me you've had enough. Um, uh, first, as you all may know, and as was stated, I served for 27 years in the House of Delegates and spent nearly 20 of those years as chairman of the House Economic Matters Committee. The state constitution establishes the role of state treasurer. And in December, what was it? December 9th that, that, of 2021, that was my election. Uh, my colleagues and my, well, now former colleagues in the General Assembly elected me to serve as state treasurer, completing treasurer Nancy Cop's uh, term. Next week, I will again seek election, this time for my own four year term. A, a significant part of my job is serving on the boards for which the legislature or the governor have asked me to serve. The one I think everyone is most familiar with is the Board of Public Works or more colloquially known as BPW, a three member board comprised of the governor, uh, Comptroller Learman and myself. Um, Maryland is the only state from what I'm told Maryland is the only state that has such a board. So we're, we're certainly unique in, in that way. The BPW is the highest administrative body whose mission is to protect and enhance the state's fiscal integrity. And I will say, um, you know, working with Governor Hogan and Comptroller Francho, whatever political, philosophical, personal differences, you know, that may exist, Maryland really comes together when it comes to, um, 
you know, our, our fiscal house, uh, dealing with the rating agencies. We put all that other stuff aside and it's just about what's good for Maryland. And I certainly enjoyed that, um, you know, with them, that relationship. And, and I know and will continue to expect that with Governor Moore and, and Comptroller Learman. Um, but uh, back to um, what I was saying, our primary responsibilities as BPW, it includes overseeing and approving capital appropriations, most state contracts, sales or transfers of state-owned properties and land, and the sale of state general obligation bonds. We meet generally twice a month um, uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, and we approve investments worth in the neighborhood of four to five hundred million dollars at every meeting. Um, I, I serve on 24 other state boards. I think I'm on 25 boards and county. Uh, when I meet with those guys next week and, and they start asking me, what do I need uh, with the job? I'm going to tell them I need to be on less boards and commissions. But I um, but I do enjoy them. Uh, one such board is the state retirement and pension systems. Uh, I am currently chair of the board of trustees um, and the board of, of the state supplemental retirement plans. So my job is to make sure all those state workers and, and, and local workers, as the case may be, when they're ready for retirement, that we make sure that we've done the best we can to, to, to make sure their investments are there for them when they need it. If you were to look at my schedule on any given day, much of my time is spent participating in these board meetings. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to meet anywhere from two to three hours in a given board meeting. And uh, you probably haven't heard uh, one such board that I've been spending a lot of time with uh, recently deals with the Maryland 529 program. Um, so that that's had a few challenges, but we are uh, we're definitely going to get those resolved. Uh, the rest of my day is spent overseeing and interacting with my staff in the office um, who work in uh, seven different divisions. Several of those divisions, such as budget and accounting, information technology and legal, for example, they provide mostly in-house services. Uh, the remaining uh, divisions are more external facing. Uh, many people are not familiar with the state treasurer's office because we deal primarily with state agencies rather than with the citizenry. Our main responsibilities include procuring all banking, financial, and insurance services for the state, issuing statewide general obligation bonds to finance our capital projects. Uh, we manage the state self-insurance program investing and safeguarding excess cash balances from all state funds. And that generally runs uh, uh, nearly $22 billion that we're talking about. And we reconcile state funds and account to the penny on a daily basis. Uh, to date as treasurer, I focused on three, uh, prim uh, three priorities. One being supporting uh, a minority business uh, program. Number two is encouraging financial literacy. And what I found that it doesn't matter how much money you have, whether you have a little or a lot, it's about managing what you have. Um, that, that's the real thing, because I've seen a lot of people, uh, you know, with a lot of money, and yet there, there's still issues there. So what we want to do is promote where we can and, and partner with folks to um, continue financial literacy. And then finally, uh, we're working on modernizing the office's policies and practice, and more importantly, equipment. Um, some of the equipment that we use are a couple of decades old. And certainly in the IT world, we know that's, that's a lifetime. Regarding the minority business participation, I have committed to doing what I can to spur MBE participation in state's business. As a member of the Board of Public Works, whenever there's an opportunity to reduce barriers to minority participation, I will speak up on behalf of those businesses. This often involves me asking the difficult questions behind the scenes, as well as at BPW meetings when I feel that a state agency should or could do better. Again, I mentioned financial literacy. Uh, I think the best use of, of the platform that I have been given is promoting savings for college and retirement and overall fiscal responsibility. We have a number of state programs that help Marylanders make sound financial decisions. And I try to support those programs in any way that I can. 
Um, and again, as it relates to modernizing IT and office policies, as technology has advanced in the world around us, I often feel left behind. Uh, the state treasurer's office though, we're not always able to keep up with the pace of this change. Recent cybersecurity threats to other agencies have compelled us to reprioritize technology improvements. We have begun migrating from um, our legacy IT systems, which is just a fancy way of saying our old systems um, that we've used for the insurance division and the tre treasury management division. These updates should enhance our ability to track and aggregate data, respond to requests for information, and otherwise engage with the public and other institutions in a more transparent and efficient manner. Let me thank you again for including me in tonight's Advocacy Day event. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, and please reach out to me or my staff if you ever have a constituent issue or an item of interest coming before the Board of Public Works or one of the boards on which I serve. I, I appreciate and value the input of our citizens of the state and I'm never too busy um, to get educated on your wants and needs. So again, thank you for having me this evening. And if, they, like I said, if there are any questions, I am happy to do so. So Treasurer Davis, thank you so very much. I, I knew there's a couple of questions and, and thank you for your very, very interesting comments. Um, I wanted to ask you that, um, you know, at, you and the controller both sit on the Board of Public Works and it is something that's very, very unique to Maryland. Um, can you explain to us, explain to the to, to, to the average activist on the phone there, like how that serves as a safeguard of our public dollars? Like what, let me put it, put it this very simply. Why do we need a public, why do we need a board of public works in Maryland, whereas other states don't have one? Like what's the advantage of us having this as a safeguard uh, in place? All right, I'm going to make every effort to be as concise as possible because I can go on and on. Let me start by saying this, a, a couple of things. One, it provides oversight. Uh, I, I believe in, in being a wise steward over the people's money. I, I've been entrusted with an awesome responsibility. And so I want to make every dollar, make sure that we're spending every dollar appropriately. That, that you know we're not cutting corners, that we're getting full value for our dollar. That's, you know, forget the MBE programs and, and all of that, it, just those tax dollars. Uh, for me and, and Comptroller Lehrman and Governor Moore, um, you know, the agencies, they go out and, and, you know, they do the procurements and so forth. And for the most part, I think they do a wonderful job. But having those second set of eyes, uh, you know, looking to make sure that we're asking the tough questions that sometimes, you know, it's easier to just, for example, we're just going to pick up an option on a contract because it's easier than going through the full procurement process. But the way I see that, you know, we could get better, you know, it may require a little more work, but we could be getting better value for our dollar if we go out and put in the extra effort. So that's one such way. But I'll tell you something else as well that you know, many people may not know. Maryland, you know, we pride ourselves on our AAA bond ratings, but in my conversations with the rating houses, um, you know, they, they express concern with some of our debt. You know, we, the way we fund our schools, most states don't do that. So they recognize that while we have a heavier debt load, some of it's related to schools and also some of it quite uh, frankly is that we, we, um, we provide our employees with very good pensions. You know, we 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 take care of them. And so they raise questions like that. But the thing that and they express concern, but the thing that one of the things that they tell us that um, makes them comfortable giving us a triple A bond rating is because we have solid management uh, practices and policies. And they went on to name them like we have a, a board of revenue estimates. We have a capital debt affordability committee. And yes, they, they mentioned our Board of Public Works as well. So just, you know, those things alone, those those scenarios alone, where we have those second set of eyes and, and all of these safeguards in place, that's why Maryland is able to um, save, uh, um, you know, maintain its AAA bond rating and thus save millions of dollars um, in, in debt because of, you know, these types of policies that we have in place. Treasurer Davis, you said you're going to be seeking, um, after filling out the remainder of Nancy Cop's term, you'll be seeking your own four-year term. At the end of four years from now, are, are there 
three things that you want to be able to look back and say that you've accomplished? Are there three priorities or three things that stick out in your mind above everything else that you want to be able to turn uh, when we have you back in four years from now? And be and maybe even, but don't worry, we'll have you back before then. And, but in four years from now, when we have you back, that you want to be able to say that you accomplished. Well, wow, that is a great question, Ron. Some of it is, you know, I had mentioned earlier, but, you know, I'm going to try to put a couple of things together. First and foremost, um, and that's my job, I want to make sure that I can come to you and, and honestly say, and, and hopefully you all can believe that I did a good job of managing the state's money. I, I that I'm in charge of, look, when I was in the high, people asked me, you know, about my experiences being, you know, treasure and money and so forth. And I tell them, well, uh, back in 1985, I was the senior class uh, treasurer and I was in charge of $200 um, for the come a long way, treasurer. From, two, from $200 to $22 <laughs> billion. Uh, it, Those are numbers I just can't fathom. But in all seriousness, again, whether it's people's um, retirement money or just Maryland's, you know, the, the daily money that we're responsible for, I want everyone to be able to go to bed at night and wake up knowing the, and believing that their money was in good hands, that, you know, they had a treasurer that they could trust and, and you know, they slept well. So that's one, and, and I know that's hard to quantify, but it's one of those things like when people say, you know it when you see it or when you don't, you'll know if I've done a good job with your money or not. And, and so that's first and foremost, the goal. Um, but secondly, contracting. Um, and, and it's not really just MBE. Um, yeah, that, that's important to me. But more so than that, as I was saying earlier, these are hard earned dollars that come from the taxpayers. It is my responsibility, as I said, to be a wise steward over those dollars. And I want to make sure that each and every one of the citizens of this state are getting fair value for every dollar that's spent, at least that comes before me, um, that, you know, we're contracting properly. Yes, that we're giving everybody a fair opportunity to participate in the program. But for me, that comes just below making sure that Every dollar is well spent, accounted for, you know, no funny business or anything like that. Um, you know, people, I want to make sure that people can trust their government or at least the part that I, I control that they know that they're getting that. And then finally, you know, we really have to keep up um, with, with our uh, technology. Um, things are constantly moving as cybersecurity has become just a huge issue to the point you really can't get insurance for it anymore. I mean, we, we're going to put out a, a procurement soon and I'm going to be interested and in see, you know, what type of response we get, but I want to make sure that we stay caught up. You know, the government tends to trail behind the, those that uh, um, like to get cute as, as I, I would say the hackers and so forth, but I want to make sure that I keep us up to date as possible. And that requires changes in our policies and procedures. And yes, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, some of our equipment, our hardware and software is dated and I've committed, you know, you know, spending whatever it takes within reason. You, you know, obviously I have to be smart about it, but I need to make sure we try to stay ahead of the hackers and if not, at least keep pace with them. And so that's something, you, you know, it's just something I'm going to stay on top of. So yes, those are three things that when, when I come back before you um, again, you go, I want you to go, Derek, how, how is the cybersecurity stuff? How, how is your IT? Uh, are you let prove to me that you've done a good job overseeing our money and how's that financial literacy going? Are, are you helping our people to be able to take care of the money that they have as well as our investment as a bonus question, I want you to make sure you stay on top of me to make sure that you're still getting great returns on your investments. Well, it sounds like you've got, you've got three clear, excellent goals and actually, and considering you're in charge of the state's money, that they are quantitative goals and, and their objective is not a surprise. I want to ask you just one, one last question. And that is, you know, a lot of people, 
uh, uh, if you would, I bet you if you took a survey in the state of Maryland, you asked people, you know, what, what is the governor responsible for? You'd find some who know. And I think if you asked for the controller, and as you go, and as you go people would, would, would re really don't have, you ask the average person in Maryland, what does the treasurer do? They'd probably assume it has something to do with money because of the title, but not be able to go ahead and really enunciate what it is. Can, is there, how, how, do you, how does your office, and I think I got a, um, a sense of my question. But how, what is the greatest impact you have on individual Marylanders' life? I heard about financial literacy and about um, a supporting minority-owned businesses. But if you had to say, what is the greatest impact your office has and its greatest opportunity to impact individual Marylanders outside of the government structure, what would that be, Treasurer? Mm, that that's a great question because there you know as i mentioned earlier really the treasurer's office it's more of an internal thing we deal with right. other state agencies you know helping them procure their banking and financial and insurance services things like that so unlike the controller's office who you can easily appoint to with taxes and the governor with pretty much everything else um our office i would say really if they were to ask what's the biggest role of the office not and i'm not talking the boards and stuff i serve on mm -hmm. because that's not, you know i'm 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 a member but that's not my office i i guess you know we it's making sure those checks and stuff are pro processed quite frankly um mm -hmm. you know child yeah. support enforcement i mean the child support checks uh, um payroll you know uh, uh that's real uh, stuff with the real impact on individual lives yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and if we ever have you know, an equipment failure or whatever. Um, and, and well, my staff will kill me, so I, I, I won't take you all there. I'll just say this. It, we, it making sure people get their money. I, I mean, even, you know, I co-sign uh, on a lot of things with, with the um, controller. So just making sure it, it, when we're talking individual citizens, um, but here's the thing, and it's funny you should say that people don't really understand because I have to explain the friends and former constituents and so forth being treasurer doesn't mean i'm not the governor and i'm not the appropriations committee so people hear treasurer and they you know they think i can write them a check and and i'm like no someone else is responsible for spending decisions once they are made you know then i help to execute it but you know trying to explain it and they seem to come away disappointed when they find out that i i don't get to decide who gets a grant and things of that nature but yes uh, you know i don't want to minimize our role certainly you know when you're waiting on a check your payroll check your child support check whatever and you're expecting it on this day you don't want to hear any excuses when it can't arrive that day so you know, I wake up every morning and certainly with our staff, everybody that's supposed to get paid, whether they're a vendor or, or, or a citizen or whatever, we try to make sure that those checks are there when they're supposed to be. So that's the biggest impact that, that I would say. And that's truly a life. That's truly a tremendous impact. Uh, Treasurer Davis, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us and you honor us by joining us here tonight at Advocacy Day and thank you for your commitment to the state of uh, to the state of Maryland and, and, and for your commitment to the well-being of all Marylanders. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And I just want to say each one of you are you guys do a heck of a job um, and you have for many years. You're well respected in Annapolis. Um, you know, it, it, I'd love to partner with you. If there's ever anything that you think the treasurer's office can help, I am always here just a phone call away and just know that, you know, I've watched you guys as well and, and hats off to you. You do a tremendous job. Thank you, Treasurer. Very much appreciate again you being with us tonight. And we, we do look forward to finding ways to collaborate with you in the future. Have a great have Thank a you, great sir. Time. And I'm going to make sure my camera's working next time we get together. <laughs> Part of your state Take technology care. renovation program, right? Yeah, I, I'm always behind, but I, I'm going to catch up. Take care, right. guys. Best wishes. Thank you. Well, on behalf of Howard County, D.C., and Baltimore, I want to thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Uh, we thank Comptroller Learman and Treasurer Davis for taking the time to share their visions for Maryland. Collectively, we know that our community's advocacy in Annapolis makes a huge difference. We hope that tonight's program helped to inspire you. If there are issues you learned about tonight, please don't hesitate to contact any of our three federations or directly contact your own lawmakers and urge them to support our issues. Next year, we hope very much to be back in Annapolis. 
where we can see everyone in person. In the meantime, we urge all of you to stay safe and have a good evening.